their Pentagon, the Obama administration. You heard Joe Courtney talk about Admiral Ruppoff's again saying today the absurdity involved in this argument. It doesn't matter what company what time matters expired. is this country. I strongly support it. Until this time has expired. Purpose still from Illinois rise. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I rise today in support of the amendment. At a time when we're running at $1.48 trillion deficits, the President's budget actually talks about a $1.6 trillion deficit. We're looking at debts of $14 trillion. We have to tighten our belt. There's no question about it. The American public's doing it. We've asked the American families and businesses across the land to tighten their belts in order to get by. The federal government should be no different. Now, we are very strong on defense. We want to make sure that those that are in harm's way have everything at their disposal to make sure that they can do the task that we've asked them to do. This, however, is a program that the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, has said we don't need it, we don't want it. We need to make sure that we are cutting back across the board in terms of all different departments. We need to go into every single one and say, where are there areas that we can cut back? Where is there duplication? Where is there areas that we can find that we don't need to spend? Spend today. This is a program that will save the American taxpayer $3 billion. $3 billion. Now, we, we admit competition is good. But why not three engines? Why not four engines? The reason why, as someone said, is we can't afford it. We can't afford two right now. We want to make sure that the engine that's out there, the one that has been awarded by the Department of Defense, has the opportunity to move forward. It is the base for the F-22. certainly has proved itself in terms of a base engine. They're making improvements. But this is an engine that they've invested over 20,000 flight hours in. This is something that is going to move forward. The question is, is are we going to fund an additional engine? I think that we need to talk about saving dollars, saving $3 billion when both the Bush administration, the current administration right now, and the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense. And when was the last time you heard any of the secretaries advocating that says we don't need this money? This is probably a very historic moment. They are absolutely 100 percent looking out for the safety of those that wear the uniform. I think, and I'm going to urge my colleagues, that we have to step forward, we have to cut back on areas, and this is an area that the Secretary of Defense has said we need to cut back on. I'm going to urge you to vote yes in favor of this amendment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman yields back. For what purpose the gentleman from Connecticut rise? The gentleman uh, is recognized for five minutes. I rise in strong support of the amendment from the gentleman uh, from Florida. You know, cutting spending is not easy, but this one should be. I think the gentleman uh, hit it right on the head. When you're talking about the Department of Defense, the Secretary of Defense, the President, the generals who command the field, all recommending against the development of a second engine, we should listen. Now, I've heard a lot of discussion tonight, as we have when we've debated this issue in the past, about uh, the dual issues of both quality and cost. But if this was really about the issues of quality and cost, then we wouldn't just be talking about building a second engine. We'd be talking about building a second plane. We'd be talking about building a second aircraft carrier. But as Representative Courtney so eloquently stated, the reason that we aren't talking about competitive bidding for a second plane, the reason why we aren't talking about two or three different aircraft carriers is that our generals, our military professionals have told us over and over again that it would be a tactical and operational nightmare to have a diversity of operational platforms with respect to these large operating systems. This isn't about quality in the end because the Army and the Navy and the Secretary of Defense tell us that it's not about quality. If this is really about 
quality and cost, then we'd have actual real competition. But we're not going to have actual real competition. What we know about these competitive bidding arrangements is that there is an explicit or implicit floor in the amount of business that you get. So whichever one of these engines is the inferior engine or the more costly engine is going to, on average, get about 40% of the business on an annual basis. That's not real competition. If we want to talk about real competition, then there has to be real winners and losers here. That's not what's going on in the proposal before us. And if this was really about quality and cost, then we wouldn't have two other tactical aircraft programs that have a single engine and also have a near spotless record of performance and cost control. We know how this works in other major aircraft acquisition programs. Single engines work. They have worked. I think in the end, though, this is really just about who we listen to. I have great respect for uh, the members of this Congress who have served for uh, years on the Armed Services uh, Committee. Uh, but I think that when we get such unanimity of opinion, such uniformness of opinion from our military generals, from the Department of Defense, and the men and women who are going to be flying these planes, we should listen. We should listen because it's the right thing to do for them, and we should listen because $3 billion isn't easy to cut out of the budget, but it's a lot easier when we have the people that are going to be handling the aircraft and the equipment telling us it's the right thing to do. I rise in support of the amendment. Gentleman yells back. For what purpose does the member from Georgia, a member of the committee, rise? Fight last word. The uh, gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. This amendment is contrary to the interest of taxpayers and our military. It's not a cost-saving amendment. It is an anti-competition amendment, therefore will cost us more money in the long run. It's recognized that the Department of Defense suffers from a lack of competition in the acquisition process. Sole source contracts already account for $140 billion, or 38% of the $366 billion that DOD spent on contracts in FY 2010. We know from experience that competing the engine on the F-35 is likely to both save money and improve the performance on both engines. It's not me saying that. It's the GAO and DOD's own internal studies have said it. DOD says it will cost $2.9 billion to develop an alternative engine, although GAO says it may be much less. The F-35 will cost about $100 billion. GAO's analysis suggests a savings of about 20 percent in procurement with an additional savings over the life cycle of the program. The alternative engine would more than pay for itself in future savings even putting aside the potential benefits in performance. The power of our tactical air force is utterly dependent on the success of the F-35 program. The total cost is approaching $400 billion. The airframe and engine portions of the program have been riddled with cost growth throughout the development effort. Are we to say that it is unreasonable to spend $450 million to ensure that our fighter pilots have the best aircraft and the best engine possible. I'm convinced that competition will make both engine variants of the F-35 better. And why do we think DOD can stand on a principle that has been proven over and over again in the marketplace? Competition leads to lower cost and better performance. Our fighters deserve this. The DOD's position against this engine has sh been shown to be faulty on analysis and driven only by short-term budget considerations. The independent QDR review panel last year stated, quote, history has shown that the only reliable source of price reduction throughout the life of a program is competi competition between dual sources. This amendment ignores that history. It will not save money and risk the combat effectiveness of our air forces. Mr. Speaker, I oppose the amendment and yield back. The gentleman yields back. For the first, the gentleman from Oregon rise. Uh, strike the last word. 
Only inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway could we be having this debate. The taxpayers are demanding uh, that we tighten our belts and save money. The Pentagon says, let's go ahead with the single engine procurement, which resulted from a competition, uh, which is, uh, you know, a quality engine. Now, if that engine has problems, uh, someone at the Pentagon should be fired. If there was problems with the original competition, a lot of people at the Pentagon should be fired. And maybe we ought to look at overhauling their procurement process. But to say now, well, we've got a good engine, they want a competition, but we've got another company that really wishes it had won the competition but didn't win the competition, and now they still want to build an engine and the taxpayers should subsidize it, which is what this is all about. Only cost $2.9 billion for them to develop an alternative engine. Only $2.9 billion inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway. That's not real money. I guess the joke is, Inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway, how many jet engines does it take to fly a single-engine fighter? Now, most Americans would think, well, that's probably not a joke, and it would be one, right? Single-engine fighter. No, it's two. Now, if we need two on the ground, maybe we need two in the air. Maybe we ought to redesign the plane and put two engines in the tail, one from one company and one from the other. In case one flames out, we've got one left at least to bring the plane back. I mean, if we're so worried about reliability, maybe we ought to just start all over again. Come on, guys. Let's not be ridiculous here. Two supply chains, two sets of mechanics, two sets of spare parts. Oh, wait a minute, this plane broke down over here, and the mechanic there and the spare parts are for the other plane. Oh, we've got to keep them sorted out by which engine they got, where they are, where they'll fly in the world, what mission they'll go on, which mechanics we send, which supply chain we send for it. No, this is not going to save money. This is not going to save money. If you did a crappy procurement, then fix it. But don't say, let's do another procurement in the way the Pentagon always does things, which will inevitably be another cost overrun procurement. So it won't only cost $2.9 billion to develop the alternative engine. We'll hear six months from now, a year from now, oh, well, we, we thought we could develop an alternative for 2.9, but it'll be 10, but don't worry, it'll still bring down the overall costs. Support this amendment. Support common sense. You know, stand up for the taxpayers and stand up for the military, which says we don't need a second engine for this plane. They're the guys who fly them. Gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. No. Gentlemen, being the chair, the noes have it. Gentleman, Florida. Uh, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Speaker, we ask for a recorded vote. Gentleman, ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida will be postponed. What purpose, the gentleman from New Jersey, rise? Yeah. Unanimous consent. The remainder of the bill through page 127, line 17, be considered as read, printed in the record, and open to amendment at any point. Without objection. Other amendments to that section of the bill? 127, line 17. Thank you. 127, line 17. What purpose, gentlemen? From North Carolina. Rise. Gentleman from North Carolina. Mr. Speaker, I offer an amendment pre-printed in the Congressional record and designated as Amendment 95. Clerk will read the amendment. Amendment number 95, printed in the Congressional record, offered by Mr. Jones of North Carolina. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, this amendment removes the new uh, $400 million from the Afghan infrastructure fund, uh, and it would be re turn to the Spending Reduction Act, and uh, I bring this amendment to the floor because of the frustration of the American people. Uh, here we are trying to find $400 million to put in an infrastructure fund for Afghanistan, which is going to be borrowed money from the Chinese to begin with. It's not even Uncle Sam's money. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, we're propping up a corrupt, dishonest government headed by President Karzai, uh, and at this time in America's history, when we are having these debates tonight that I've heard all day long, 
with the frustration of the members of Congress from both parties that here we cannot even balance the budget of this country and we're trying to find this money to go to the infrastructure of Afghanistan and we're going to say to the American people we can't help you with, with your infrastructure needs in your counties, in your towns, in your cities. It makes absolutely no sense to me and more important than me is to the American people. Uh, I also would like to mention that uh, the Afghan Infrastructure Fund would help create another bridge to nowhere. It's going to be money that cannot even be accounted for the majority of the time, and I make mention of that for this reason. The, re the recent special uh, Inspector General's report for Afghanistan Reconstruction Report released on January the 30th, 2011, uh, cited significant fraud, waste, and abuse with Afghan uh, Reconstruction Funds. I do not know why in the world we cannot make the statement to the American people that we're going to see that the $400 million going to a dishonest, dysfunctional government overseas cannot be returned to help reduce the debt deficit of this country or even return to the city and counties throughout the country of America. So uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, that is my, uh, I will reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. What purpose the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Eliminating the $400 million Afghan, Afghanistan infrastructure fund is ill-conceived and unwise. This fund provides funding for high-priority, large-scale infrastructure programs in support of the civ civilian military campaign in Afghanistan. These projects are critical, critical to convincing the Afghan population to reject the insurgency and side with the government. This, in turn, significantly reduces the threat to our troops and quickens the security transition process, which we all seek. Not only is this funding a top priority of the Secretary of State and Defense, it is also a top priority of General David Petraeus. This fund is so directly related to the safety and security of our troops that it needs to be preserved, and thus I urge a no vote on the amendment. Gentleman yields back. What person, gentleman from Washington, rise? I move to strike the requisite number of words. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. The amendment would eliminate all funding in the bill for the Afghan Infrastructure Fund, a total of $400 million. Establishing this fund at this level of funding was done at the request of the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State in a joint letter to the Congressional Defense Committees in November 2010. The funding was not added to the bill. It was derived by reducing the amount available for the Commander's Emergency Response Program. DOD requested that funding for this account be obtained in this manner. The Department of Defense and State view this fund as essential to completing large-scale infrastructure projects in Afghanistan, such as electrical power generation. Such proje projects provide the means for economic activity which will help to reduce risk for U.S. troops and help improve security in Afghanistan. So I urge rejection of this amendment. Chairman yields back. What purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Sure, I to strike the requisite number of words. Chairman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, the reason we have troops in Afghanistan is to prevent Afghanistan from again becoming a sanctuary from which terrorists will launch attacks against us for us to one day be able to withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, the Afghan people have to be able to stand on their own two feet. And this fund is designed to help them do that. The people there have to be able to resist the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and other groups that want to undermine their security and use Afghanistan once again as a terrorist base. This program, as has been mentioned, is a very high priority of our own military commander in Afghanistan, General Petraeus. Part of the reason it's one of his priority is, as the gentleman from New Jersey said, this helps keep our own troops safe. When we are able to work with the Afghan people and develop the country, our troops in the country ha are, have a, a less danger uh, opposing them. It is less likely that they will, will suffer some of the uh, problems from the indigent population. But the second reason General Petraeus believes this is very important is that it's an integral part of his counterinsurgency campaign plan. Uh, 
so to withdraw this money at this point makes his job more difficult and increases the danger to our troops. I don't think that makes sense at any level. The other point I'd make is this. As, as the gentleman from Washington said, this was a request from the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense for a fund that would both agencies would work on. One of these days, this government is going to have to get to interagency funds so that you don't have the State Department working on one hand, Defense Department on another, other agencies uh, uh, doing their own thing. We have to have a combined effort. And this fund is at least a step in that direction. The interagency nature of it helps to prevent waste, abuse, misuse of these funds because you do have the, the extra oversight on its use. But I think the key point is this is a question of our national security to help the Afghans stand on their own two feet, and I believe the amendment should be rejected. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back his uh, balance of his time. Before the uh, further debate, the uh, clerk will read additional uh, information into the record. Page 127, line 17, Afghanistan Infrastructure Fund, including transfer of funds. What, what purpose, gentlemen? California rise. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the requisite number of words. Gentlemen, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, to my friend from North Carolina, who I believe does have the best intentions at heart. I believe he's doing this for the right reason. Uh, he wants to get out of Afghanistan, and, and, he, and he believes that Afghanistan uh, is a very corrupt country with very corrupt leadership. The problem is, is that things in this world aren't perfect. I, I served for six months in the Marine Corps in Afghanistan in 2007, didn't do anything of, of significance, but when I was there, I saw what really turned the people of Afghanistan towards America, what made them turn around, what made them change their mind. And it, it wasn't us killing people uh, who caused us uh, to stay up at night and worry about them. That's what we're uh, worried about. What the Afghans are, are worried about is do they have electricity? Can they drive on the roads? Can they put fruit in their Mack truck and drive it 20 miles and sell it at the next town? Um, do their lights work? Is their trash getting picked up? Is their sewer getting cleaned out? General Petraeus understands this is counterinsurgency. That's what counterinsurgency means. I want to get out of Afghanistan, too. It's an expensive war in blood and treasure, but it's a war that was not started by us. It was started by two airplanes flying into two towers, and it has cost us more. 9-11 has cost us more than Afghanistan ever will in what it's done to this, this nation. Um, making us second guess who our friends are, sending us to Afghanistan. And uh, I, I would ask my uh, friend from North Carolina this, and I'm going to yield the balance of my time to my uh, friend from North Carolina. If we're not the ones helping out the Afghan people, I'll tell you who it's going to be. The Taliban. The Taliban are the bankers of Afghanistan. They have drug money and they use it to loan to the uh, locals in Afghanistan. So if we don't help them out, if we don't become their uh, friends, if we don't befriend the people, the counterinsurgency doesn't work. And, uh, and I think that the, my friend, uh, if he knew that we would leave quicker, we would leave Afghanistan in victory quicker uh, by keeping this money there, uh, I, th I think he would withdraw his amendment. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from North Carolina. The gentleman else is down, the gentleman from North Carolina. Mr. Speaker, how much time is left? Stand at the this? microphone. Mr. Mr. Gentlemen, remain at this mic. How much time does Mr. Hunter have? Yeah. Gentleman has two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. I want to thank him for yielding this time, and I would say that if I thought Karzai was an honest man that would, uh, would, would appreciate the American taxpayers' money, uh, I would feel differently, quite frankly. But I realize it is a corrupt government. I wish that what you say, and I trust you, I have great respect for you as well, but we're dealing with a dishonest, dysfunctional government. When Karzai was quoted in the Washington Post in December saying, I have three enemies, one being the American, uh, one being America, one being the Taliban, one being the international community, and if I had to choose one of these as a friend, I would choose the uh, Taliban. This is why I wanted to speak tonight, bring this forward, let the members vote up or down, that's fine with me. But the point is, this is money that we could be using right here in this country. If I thought Karzai was an honest broker, I would probably not even offer the amendment. Will the gentleman yield? Sure, I would yield. It's your what time, and I thank you for yielding to me. Re 
yep. reclaiming my, my time. This is an interagency fund. DOD, State Department, USAID, these different American agencies, they're going to be the ones distributing this money. I, I doubt Karzai ever sees this money as it would go straight to contractors, either Afghan or, or from here, from the, uh, the U.S. or uh, other countries. Well, I yield it to the gentleman. Okay. I, my answer to that would be that uh, I, would, I would hope that this would prove to be true. The problem is we always know that when you've got a dysfunctional government, you've got a dishonest man, it might be intended to go this way, but too many times it does not. And I, I would honestly say to you that uh, I, I offer this amendment in behalf of the American people because they can't fix their streets, they can't fix their roads, and by God, it's only $400 million, but to a lot of people in my district, that's a lot of money going to a dishonest leader of a country in Afghanistan. Reclaiming my, my time, Mr. Chairman. May I? Uh, 36. How much time? 36. 36. $400 million is a lot of money, and Americans do need that money. But I would answer that with this. The men and women that have given their lives over in Afghanistan, the men and women, as you well know, representing Camp Lejeune and all, all of those Marines, the men and women that have, have given their time and their, and their blood for this country, I think deserve to be backed up by us by saying we're going to give the money to your boss, General Petraeus, so that we can win the war and leave victoriously. And I think that's what this $400 million does. And with, with that, I oppose the uh, gentleman's amendment and yield back to balance my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. No. Chair, uh, the opinion of the chair of the no is had on that, I would like to ask for the eyes and nose. Recorded what is, uh, is asked for. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings of the amendment offered by the gentleman from North Carolina will be postponed. The clerk will re resume reading. Page 130, line 7. Afghanistan Security Forces Fund, $11,619,283,000 to remain available until September 30th, 2012. Iraq Security Forces Fund, one billion five hundred million dollars to remain available until September what 30th, 2012. What purpose New Jersey rise? Uh, New Jersey, should we move ahead to the next amendment? I believe uh, Mr. Holt has an amendment, and then we're going to move. I think, with I, can we move? To, I, th I thought it was. What purpose, is General from New Jersey? To page one, th Mr. Holt, can I ask we go to page 131. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holtz, amendment is ready, ripe. Uh, yeah. Chairman, I do have an amendment. The gentleman has an amendment. Uh, clerk will read the amendment. Amendment number 237, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Holt of New Jersey. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to eliminate the $1.5 billion in funding for the Iraqi Security Forces Fund. If we're going to be cutting Pell Grants and energy research and heating assistance for families here in the United States, we certainly should take a hard look at Pentagon spending as well. Would taxpayers want their dollars to go to pay for Iraqi police on the streets of Baghdad when we're cutting funding for police in Trenton, New Jersey, and other cities and towns across our nation? I want my colleagues to understand what the authors of H.R. 1 are proposing here today. It's about choices. My colleagues, I'm sure, could present a good justification for funding Iraq security forces. I certainly want to see the people of Iraq living in peace and freedom, free from harm and either domestic or foreign harm. However, the government of Iraq has ample revenue from oil sales to uh, pay for Iraq's security. In contrast, our country faces not only a budget deficit, but critical unmet domestic needs. And this legislation before us today makes many, many unwise cuts. H.R. 1 calls for spending $1.5 billion in taxpayers' money to pay for foreign police officers in Iraq while simultaneously cutting $300 million for the highly successful COPS program here at home.
The COPS program is vital. Our local police departments count on it to help them hire additional officers to combat, combat crime in our communities and to provide true community policing. The contrast couldn't be more stark and absurd. Have American taxpayers foot the bill for police in Baghdad, but not for police in America. H.R. 1 showcases the misguided priorities of the new majority. What are they thinking? Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. I not reserve the balance of time. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of time. Gentleman of New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to my colleague from New Jersey's Gentlemen, amendment. Right now, five minutes. The Iraqi Security Forces Fund is required to enable the Iraqi Security Forces to reach minimum essential capabilities. These capabilities will allow those forces to maintain internal security with police forces in the lead and defense forces in support while building foundational capabilities for the Iraqi military forces to provide external defense prior to U.S. forces departure on 31 December 2011. This is our nation's commitment, our president's commitment, our commander-in-chief's commitment. Uh, it is a bipartisan commitment. It is more than just this ma majority's commitment. To see the departure of our U.S. forces uh, in, in that time frame. This Iraqi Security Forces Fund funds the following five categories equipment purchases and transportation of equipment, weapons, ammunition, vehicles, communications gear, and spare parts. Infrastructure projects such as construction improvements of police stations and military bases, training centers, maintenance facilities, and border enforcement facilities, among other infrastructure. Training and operations projects and programs such as training school and maintenance facilities, vehicles for training centers, and training of security forces. Sustainment of security forces through maintenance programs, human resources, information management systems, support service, and medical services. Other activities such as detainee operations, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. These are essential to speed our departure from Afghanistan. So, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no on uh, Mr. Holt's amendment. Jim, and yields back? Yield back. <laughs> the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. No. Being the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Chairman, on that, I ask a recorded vote. Gentleman requests a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment. Further Proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Jersey will be postponed. Clerk. Procurement. What, what purpose the gentleman from New Jersey, right? Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the remainder of the bill through page 154, line 15, be considered as read, printed in the record, and open to amendment at any point. Without objection. Clerk, resume reading. Section 9013. Not more than 85% of the funds provided in this title for operation and maintenance be available for obligation or expenditure until the Secretary submits the report to the Congre oh. Congressional Defense Committees. This division may be cited as the Department of Defense Appropriations Act 2011. General Wall from Wisconsin, rise. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk, read the amendment. Amendment number 45, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin. M Mr. Chairman. What published the gentleman in New Jersey rise? Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order on the gentlewoman's amendment. Point of, point of order reserved. The gentlewoman has five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in support of my amendment and in opposition to H.R. 1, the Republican bill to slash services to the American people, a measure that I believe threatens jobs and our fragile economic recovery. I agree with my Republican colleagues that we must reduce the deficit and bring our budget into balance, but we must be smart about it. This bill harms the people who tend to our health, those who educate our children, and those who patrol our neighborhoods and protect our safety. This bill frustrates our economic recovery by making job training and career training unattainable 
for many Americans. Meanwhile, it does little to restrain excessive military spending or eliminate government handouts to big oil or eliminate tax breaks for multi-millionaires. Today, we spend millions of dollars each day in Afghanistan and Iraq, spending that is protected in the bill before us. At the same time, this Republican bill to slash services cuts community health centers to the core. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the work of community health centers, they provide essential health services to children and families who lack insurance and have extremely limited incomes. Community health centers provide a big bang for the buck. They tend to the health care needs of more than 17 million uninsured or underinsured men, women, and children in America each year. The cut in the Republican bill before us is so deep that it will result in the elimination of services to more than half of the current capacity of community health centers today to serve our neighbors. An estimated 127 new health centers in underserved areas will close across the United States. In some communities, patients with diabetes, heart disease, HIV and AIDS, pregnant women, and sick children will have nowhere to turn except perhaps emergency rooms ill-suited to their needs. Thousands of health care workers in rural and urban underserved communities will lose their jobs. I've already heard from the director of community health centers in both Beloit and Janesville, Wisconsin. He let me know about the serious impact this slash of funding will have on thousands in just one Wisconsin county. Mr. Chairman, my amendment restores community health center funding, but I pay for it with a commensurate cut in wasteful defense spending. Mr. Chairman, I said at the outset, we need to be smart if we are to cut spending without compromising our jobs, our economic recovery, and our future. I agree with our president when he said, if we are to win the future, we must out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build the rest of the world. But we can't do that by cutting Pell Grants for students and slashing the research budgets of the National Institutes for Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy. This unwise bill jeopardizes our nation's recovery and future. And it's particularly troublesome to me this week because it falls on top of efforts by Wisconsin's governor to cut health, education, and public safety services and to diminish the rights of the public servants who provide them. Mr. Chairman, I stand here today in solidarity with my fellow Wisconsinites as I fight for a better future for all Wisconsinites and all Americans. I urge an I vote on my amendment and a no vote on H.R. 1, and I yield back the balance of my time. Yield for a second. I, I just want to say that I share your enthusiasm for community health centers. I've seen them all across my district. They are wonderful. We're going to have to keep fighting for them. I thank the gentleman. I yield back the remainder of Gentleman my time. yields back her time. The gentleman from New Jersey will state his point uh, of order. I insist on my point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. Mr. Chairman, the amendment proposed to amend portions of the bill not yet read. The amendment may not be considered unblocked under Clause 2 F of Rule 21 because the amendment proposes to transfer between subcommittees. I ask for a ruling from the chair. Member, we should be heard on the ruling or heard on the point of order. Gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do rise to be heard on the point of order. Mr. Chairman, um, here are the rules of the House uh, for the 112th Congress. And uh, accompanying it, we also have something called uh, HRES 92. And Oftentimes when we get to the floor, we, we talk in inside the Beltway language that's really hard, I think, for the American public to uh, follow. But I, I just want to make clear that HRES 92 is a document drafted by the Republicans to govern debate on this bill and this bill only. But 
our House rules specifically allow an amendment such as the one that I have presented to this body and was just debating a moment ago on the House floor. And I think it's a wise rule because it really helps us pay as we go. It allows us to cut Chairman, spending in. Chairman, the gentlelady needs to state a point of order. Regular order, please. Well, I believe the gentleman stood. Well, I'm must debating the point of must order. Be to the point, confined to the point of order. Um, anyways, the, the underlying House rules specifically permit an amendment such as the one I have offered and earlier uh, debated in front of this body because it allows us to cut spending in one area in order to restore uh, services or programs of greater priority in another. In other words, it, it aids us in our job to pay as we go. Mr. Chairman, so, respectfully, th this, this is not. Uh, this is not regular order. Gentlewoman's uh, remarks must be confined to the point of order. Well, so under the rules of this House, my amendment would be fine, but in the House Resolution 92, to which the gentleman referred, which governs simply the debate that we're uh, engaged in this evening, it waives the rule of the underlying uh, uh, of the House. It waives the rule of the House, the People's House. So I just want to make it clear, I think I know how the Chairman will end up ruling, but that this is the Republicans' will that I cannot advance this amendment, and not because of the underlying rules of this House. House wish to be heard. To be considered in the en bloc pursuant to Clause 2F of Rule 21, an amendment must propose only to transfer appropriations for, among objects in the bill. Because the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin proposes also another kind of change in the bill, namely to reach back into the reading, it, it may not avail itself of Clause 2F to address this, the portion of the bill that is not yet read. Gentlewoman's amendment. Board of Order sustained. Resume reading. Page 156, line 1, Division B, full year continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2011. The following sums are hereby appropriated for fiscal year 2011, namely Title I general provisions, Section 1101, amounts may be necessary at the level specified in subsection provided in Appropriations Acts for fiscal year 2010 for projects or activities that are not otherwise specifically provided for. For purposes of this division, the term level means an amount. The level referred to in subsection A shall be the amounts appropriated in the Appropriations Act referred to in such subsection, including transfers and obligation limitations. Section 1102, appropriations made by Section 1101 shall be available in the manner that would be provided by the Pertinent Appropriations Act. Section 1103, appropriations provided by this division that carried a multiple year or no year period of availability shall retain a comparable period of availability. Section 1104, the requirements, authorities, and other provisions of the Appropriations Acts referred to in Section 1101A shall continue in effect for the date specified in Section 1106. Section 1105, no funds made available or authority granted shall be used to initiate or resume any project for which appropriations, funds, or other authority were specifically prohibited during fiscal year 2010. Section 1106, unless otherwise provided, appropriations and funds made available and authority granted pursuant to this division shall be available. Section 1107, Expenditures made pursuant to the Continuing Appropriations Act 2011, Public Law 111-242, shall be charged to the applicable appropriation fund or authorization. Section 1108. Funds appropriated by this division may be obligated and expended, notwithstanding Section 10 of Public Law 91-672. Section 1109. In addition, the following amount shall be available for the following accounts for advance payments for the first quarter of fiscal year 2012. Department of Labor, Employment Standards Administration. Gentle, what person, gentle, uh, gentleman from New Jersey, rise. Uh, I am asking if it is in order to offer amendment number three uh, as the designee of Mr. DeFazio.
Is the gentleman referring to amendment number 97 printed in the record? Number 97. Number 97. That's correct. The reading is not yet progressed to that point. Has not progressed. Has not. I thank the chair. Present reading. Department of Labor Employment Standards Administration special benefits for, dis for disabled coal miners. 41 million dollars. Department of Health and Human Services. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services grants to states for Medicaid, $86,445,289,000. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, payments to states for child support enforcement and family support programs, $1,200,000,000 to remain available until expended. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, payments to states for foster care and permanency, $1,850,000,000. Social Security Administration Supplemental Security Income Program, $13,400,000,000. Section 1110, amounts incorporated by reference in this division that were previously designated as available for overseas deployment and other activities pursuant to uh, Senate Concurrent Resolution 13, 111th Congress are designated for contingency, contingency operations directly related to the global war on terrorism pursuant to Section 3C2 of House Resolution 5, 112th Congress as an emergency requirement pursuant to Section 403A of Senate Concurrent Resolution 13, 111th Congress. Section 1111, any language specifying an earmark in an Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2010 or in a committee report or joint, joint statement accompanying such an act shall have no legal effect with respect to funds appropriated by this division. For purposes of this section, the term earmark means congressional earmark or congressionality directed spending item. Section 1112, none of the funds appropriated may be used to transfer, release, or assist in the transfer or release to or within the United States, its territories, or possessions, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or any other detainee who is not a United States citizen or a member or of the armed forces of the United States and is or will or is or was held on or after June 24, 2009 at the United States Naval Station Guantanamo Bay, Cuba by the Department. Section 1113, none of the funds appropriated may be used to transfer any individual detainee at Guantanamo to the custody or control of the individual's country of origin, any other foreign country or any other foreign entity, unless the Secretary submits to Congress the certification described in subsection not later than 30 days before the transfer. For the purposes of this section, the term individual detained at Guantanamo means any individual who is located at United States Naval Station, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, as of October 1, 2009. is not a citizen of the United States or a member of the armed forces of the United States. And in the custody or under the effective control of the department, the term foreign terrorist organization means any organization so designated by the the Secretary under Section 219 of the Immigration and Nationality Act, Section 1114. None of the funds may be used to construct any facility in the United States as territories or possessions to house any individual described in subsection C. Section 1115. None of the funds may be obligated by any covered executive agency in contravention of the certification requirement of the Iran Sanctions Act of 1996. Section 1116, Section 550B of the Public Law 109-295, as amended by Section 550 of Public Law 111-83, shall be applied by substituting the date specified in Section 1106 of this division for October 4, 2010. Section 1117, Section 1B2 of the Passport Act of June 4, 1920, shall be applied by substituting the date specified in Section 1106 of this division for September 30, 2010. Section 1118, Section 1115D of Public Law 111-32 shall be applied by substituting the date specified in Section 1106 of this division for October 1, 2010. Section 1119, 
The authority of the Foreign Affairs Reform and Restructuring Act of 1998 shall remain in effect through the date specified in Section 1106 of this division. Section 1120, the provisions of Title II of the McKinley-Vento Homeless Assistance Act shall continue in effect. Title II, Agricultural, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration and Related Agencies, Section 1201. The level for agricultural programs, Office of the Secretary, shall be $5,061,000. Section 1202, the level for agricultural programs, Office of Tribal Relations, shall be $0. Section 1203, the level for agricultural programs, Executive Operations, Office of the Chief, e Chief Economist, shall be $10,032,000. Section 1204, the level for agricultural programs, Executive Operations, National Appeals Division, shall be $14,711,000. Section 1205, the level for agricultural programs, Executive Operations, Office of the Budget and Program Analyst, shall be $9,054,000. Section 1206, the level for agricultural programs, Office of Advocacy and Outreach, shall be $0. Section 1207, for agricultural programs, Office of the Chief Information Officer shall be $17 million. Section 1208, the level for agricultural programs, Office of the Chief Financial Officer shall be $5,954,000. Section 1209, the level for agricultural programs, Office of Civil Rights shall be $21,551,000. Section 1210, the level for agricultural programs, agricultural buildings and facilities and rental payments shall be $259,751,000. Section 1210, the level for agricultural programs, buildings and facilities and rental payments shall be $259,751,000. Section 1211, the level for agricultural programs, hazardous materials management shall be $0. Section 1212, the level for agricultural programs, departmental administration shall be $30,706,000. Section 1213, the level for agricultural programs, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Congressional Relations, shall be $3,877,000. Section 1214, the level for agricultural programs, Office of Communications, shall be $9,514,000. Section 1215, the level for agricultural programs, Office of the Inspector General, shall be $80,000,000. Section 1216, the level for agricultural programs, Office of the General Counsel, shall be $39,620,000. Section 1217, the level for agricultural programs, Economic Research Service, shall be $79,500,000. Section 1218, the level for agricultural programs, National Agricultural Statistics Service, shall be $151,565,000. What person is up for order rise? Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the remainder of uh, Section 172.22 of the bill, or the bill through pages 172 to 22, be considered as read, printed in the record, and open to amendment at any point. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Clerk will remain, re, uh, resume reading. I, at this point, I would have an amendment. Please read the next paragraph. Section 1223, the level for agricultural programs, National Institute of Food and Agriculture Integrated Activities shall be $24,874,000. What person, gentlemen, from Oregon Rice? Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Chairman has an amendment at the desk. Clerk will read the amendment. Ninety-seven, number ninety-seven. Amendment number ninety-seven, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. DePazio <coughs> of Oregon. Chair from Oregon is recognized for five minutes on his amendment. Uh, 
At this point, I'd, I'd like to bring to the attention of the Congress that we're about to eliminate a program which is incredibly cost effective, which truly supports uh, a growing proportion of profitable small family farms uh, in America, which is to help uh, with research and transition to organic production. Uh, the, uh, in, <coughs> the, uh, in the most recent statistics, the organic sector of the agriculture uh, production in this country was nearly uh, 27 billion dollars. That's up from 4 billion dollars in 1997. It, there's over uh, 14,500 family farms engaged uh, in organic agriculture and they've been experiencing dramatic increases. Now you might say, well why would we want to continue to research and help them? Well, we're spending a tremendous amount of money and research and subsidies on other crops which are already obviously uh, totally uh, developed and uh, do not need assistance. In this case, we're talking about many people who own struggling family farms want to convert. Uh, they're interested in moving to organics because they know there is potential for higher profitability uh, with those products uh, with increasing and dramatically increasing uh, demand. In fact, uh, the, uh, the USDA says that the average uh, for small, these are truly small farms, not what some people consider small farms, organic farms was $46,000 uh, last year and for uh, all uh, farms, small farms was uh, 26000 So there are many people who are engaged as truly uh, small farming activities uh, who want to stay on the land, don't want to parcel it up, don't want to sell to developers, they want to continue to live there, raise their kids there, uh, but they're having trouble making ends meet. And this is an opportunity for many folks, an opportunity both for consumers uh, who are demanding uh, organically produced produce and for producers. And I think it would be very short-sighted to zero out uh, this program at this point in time. So I'm, I'm asking that we take a very small uh, percentage of the uh, APHIS budget, uh, well less than 1%, uh, and on, at least on a temporary measure, uh, uh, restore the cuts uh, to, this, uh, for, to the transitional and organic research portion of the budget. Uh, in the hope that we can reach agreement on a sustainable way to, to fund this program in the future and look at more equitable distribution of funds both for research and subsidies and other things that goes on in the Department of Agriculture. The amount of money we're asking for uh, here uh, at $5 million is a tiny fraction of 1% of the amount of money that we're spending on subsidies for five crops in eight states to pay people not to grow things. Uh, now I think to actually help people to grow things, to grow healthy produce, uh, to supply the American people, to be able to live on their farms, uh, support their families, and pass on the farm to the next generation, uh, that this would be a very, very wise investment. And I, I wish that this had not been chosen for a cut. And I'm hopeful that uh, my colleagues uh, will see the wisdom in restoring this cut and then looking uh, in the next uh, farm bill or in the next appropriation uh, to an equitable division of these funds. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of time. What person, the gentleman from Georgia, rise? Strike the last word. The gentleman rise to strike the last word. The gentleman from Georgia, recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I rise to oppose the amendment, although I know the author and the two authors of this amendment are very sincere about it, and I think that they are underscoring something that we want to encourage people to be organic farmers, but if you consider that organic farming is a 25 to 27 billion dollar industry, in fact my friend Mr. DeFazio just used the number 27 billion dollars, it's a successful ongoing, ongoing and growing industry already and I do not believe that we need to continue the transition subsidy program to get more farmers in it. American farmers know where the profit is. They follow the commodity. The commodity follows the profit. They get into an area where it's going to be most profitable already. But I'm also concerned that the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service has already been cut $38 million. And this is a service that enforces animal welfare, um, uh, pests and diseases. It's very important to all farmers. It's cut at this point 4.3% and I hate to see an additional five million taken out of it. So while I, I have sympathy for 
what the gentlemen are trying to do, and, and I know that they are great advocates for organic farmers. I oppose the amendment at this time, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. What person?